What's up, screeners? I am Nico Luro, and it is time for the Top 10 Show. And joining me today, all the way from New York, New York, from the other side of the Atlantic, we have got a professor, a renowned writer from St. Lawrence University, Dr. Bob Kowser. Thank Welcome. you, Nico. Thank you very much. So why are you here, Bobby? Well, as you know, uh, I'm a war film aficionado, and uh, I teach a course on uh, 20th century or war films since since Vietnam. Um, and you and I have a long-standing argument about what uh, what movies would make this top ten list. So we decided we'd do this episode and finally hash it out. Finally, it's finally, it. Finally, yes. So for those of you watching for the first time, this is how the top 10 show works. Bobby and I knew we were going to do war movies, so we've each gone away and made our separate top 10 list. We're now back, we're filming for you guys, and we are going to run down from 10 down to 1. Bobby's the guest, so he's going to be starting, he's going to deliver his bottom 4, then I'll deliver my bottom 4. Then we'll go back over to his next 4, my next 4, and then we'll trade one apiece. If at any stage during the argument one of us has a movie which is lower than the other, that person who has it in the higher position has to say punt, and we'll talk about that movie when we get to the higher position and I'd also like to remind everyone graphic coming up now warning this is an x-rated show so we can uh, I should have said New York fuck a New York we can swear all we want on here let's do this all right so I start do you um, want to maybe, before we actually get into it, do you want to explain what constitutes a war movie, given that you are the professor here? Well, I mean, what, what the films that I chose for, for, my, uh, for my course um, were films that specifically uh, would have fit a kind of classic definition of a war film in the sense that they um, depicted, one way or another, combat um, um, involving American forces since Vietnam. But that's changed a lot, obviously, of a film like... Um, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, which isn't on my list, you know, make, is, is a very different kind of, of war film, but it yep. is the way America wages war in the 21st century. Uh, this most recent Helen Mirren film, remind me of the title. About well, the Eye in the Sky? Eye in the Sky. Is, is, I would consider that a war movie, although it's yep. not the kind of classic Green Berets, John Wayne war movie. I hope um, that's not on your list. Green Berets or Eye in the Sky? Green Berets. Neither. Neither. <laughs> neither on my list. <laughs> but it is it's a kind of it's like the longest day it's kind of a gold standard for how the the, the Hollywood studios made war movies prior yeah. to my, my course starts with one that is on my list, so should I say it or not? No, no, not okay. quite yet. The one thing I do want to specify to everyone there's a lot of other movies which aren't necessarily 20th century because that's what we're focusing on here we're doing 20th century and maybe some 21st century but i mean the huge wars of the last hundred years have been obviously been world war one world war two arguably the vietnam war and the cold war of course that's what uh, that, that's what our main focus is going to be so for those of you going hey what about braveheart what about troy yes arguably war movies but they're not making the list spartacus Spartacus, I would say, is a sword and sandals. Again, if you want to see a sword and sandals, you can download it for free on iTunes. And actually considering that, guys, if you are listening to this on iTunes, please hit that subscribe button and leave a review and a rating, please. Helps us out a lot. And if you're watching on YouTube, jump in the description below because you can download this for free on iTunes. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Now, Bobby? Yes. Over to you. This first film is one I don't know if you've ever even heard of, but one of my obsessions when I was 10 or 11 years old was the USS Nimitz, which was the, the largest at the time, largest aircraft carrier in the world. And it, held, it, it, it was home to my favorite aircraft, which was the F-14 Tomcat. Now in this war movie, which, is, which actually won awards- What was the title again? Final Countdown. Final it's Countdown. It's actually a sci-fi film, or won awards as a sci-fi film, but okay. here's the plot now. The USS Nimitz, captained by Kirk Douglas, who appears elsewhere on my list, and and it is goes it goes through an electrical storm that mm -hmm. takes it back to 1941, mm -hmm. and it has to actually combat Japanese. It goes back to Pearl Harbor. It's it's based out of Pearl Harbor. Okay. In the film, it goes back in time and it has to fight the it has to to battle Pearl Harbor all over again. So you have F-14 Tomcats. Fighting Japanese zeros. No, yep. it's not a fair fight. Martin Sheen, <laughs> Martin Sheen, who's also elsewhere on my list, and mine, um, is uh, plays a reporter who's who's uh, stationed on on board ship, writing a story about this terrific new modern carrier. 
Um, and uh, he, so he's kind of the, the correspondent who is helping us to understand what's okay. happening. This is a totally idiosyncratic personal choice because I love Tomcats, I love Martin Sheen, and, and Kirk Douglas is a St. Lawrence University alum. I don't know if you <laughs> Okay, so it's a personal choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's fine. Like I said, this That's is the only one like that on my list. That I haven't heard of it, to be honest. I'll uh, make sure to check it out. I know you like science fiction as much as you like war movies. So yeah, I like Kirk Douglas and I like Martin Sheen too. Okay, the next one is uh, one that I uh, that I watched on television with my mother many years ago. It's from 1955, Bridges at Toko Ri with William Holden at, um, and uh, uh, Mickey Rooney. Um, and uh, wow. Holden, Holden and Grace Kelly as William Holden's wife. So again, set aboard an aircraft carrier. Okay. You can see a theme here. But uh, Holden <laughs> is a decorated World War II pilot who's called back into service after returning home from World War II and having a family with Grace Kelly. He's called back into service to fight in uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. And he and Mickey Rooney are downed behind enemy lines. And that's kind of where the movie picks up. And it's very dramatic and terrific performances by both of them. So that's my number nine. I've heard of this one. It's definitely on my to-see list. Um, okay. Um, how, uh, what's the running time and what year was it released? Then? 1955. Who was the I don't know the. Okay, so it's a classic. This. Yes, um, but he, yes, you should you should all see it. Number <laughs> eight is a 2014 film called Kajaki. Well, okay, okay, I need to put a pin in this. Um, <laughs> there's one of the three films he's just mentioned I've heard of. Nothing wrong with what you're saying, but I just need to warn the regular listeners and watchers of the Silver Screen Show. Obviously, Film we, snob. Yeah. We, we cover a lot of modern movies. Now, granted, with the war movies, there is going to be an element of going back to, you know, the older movies here, but 1955 and uh, what's this one you've just mentioned? And the Jackie's 2014. Jackie. It's British. I haven't, well, forgive me, I haven't heard it, of it. It's, a, it's an indie. And of I'll course, it's an indie. I'll tell you what I love about this film. What I tell about this film that I love is that it's set in Afghanistan. So in that way, it's just like um, Lone Survivor or Zero Dark Thirty or um, um, Hurt, Locker. Hurt Locker, things like that. But it's it's it uh, covers the experience of a British regiment or company that's in in Afghanistan and I the, the great the great part about the film is that they it, it reveals all the things that we love about war movies war mm -hmm. movies present us with life in ex, in the extreme okay so yep. courage under pressure etc camaraderie all those things but the enemy mm -hmm. is actually the Russian occupiers who left landmines 30 years ago so that's the only there's no okay, real enemy nice. and it's so it so it takes it twists our idea challenges our idea of what a war movie is. yeah no that's cool so, like so it's what it's a knock-on effect from what were the right well hang on obviously yeah obviously the russians were at war with the afghanis weren't yeah. they yeah yeah, yeah 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 of course my fourth uh and my first four is a bridge too far great great movie. ensemble cast great soundtrack uh you know, I, I just, it was one of the first war movies that are Anthony Hopkins, anything with Anthony oh, Hopkins or Anthony Gene Hopkins Hackman. and Gene Hackman and Clint Eastwood. with a terrible and, Polish accent. Yeah, the list goes on and on. Yeah, this yeah. is one of the greatest casts well, I've Elliot ever seen. Gould, Robert Redford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could list Harrison them all day. Ford's in it, isn't he? I don't remember. I'm pretty sure Ford's I got an early role in it. I think he's in, but. Uh, the... <laughs> you can't say shit like that. <laughs> yes, like, I think I did. <laughs> oh, man. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> just. Excuse me one second. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, this will be used repeatedly throughout. This is, you know, this is called our palm door here. So over to me. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's an epic, epic, epic on, in terms of scale. It's about epic. Operation Market Garden, right? Right. Yeah. Which, is, which was uh, Monty's idea and Montgomery's idea. And it was, the plan went one bridge too far, they said. They yeah. would have, would have succeeded, lost oodles and oodles of allied forces mm. uh, in, in this attempt to, to really bring Germany to its knees quicker than actually happened. Yeah. It didn't work out. Great film. Recommend it to everyone. Haven't seen it for years. I've got to revisit A Bridge Too Far. I but own the DVD. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a disc. I've got the same saying, yeah. thing upstairs. Yeah. He just bloody film stop. Yeah, I'm not one of those millennials who only watches Netflix, although granted I do watch a lot of Netflix. No, I'll be have to tell you, sir, I've got a very large collection of DVDs upstairs. I've, I've very large. I've still got a few VHSs. Oh. Yeah. There you go. If you want to go old school. All right. So what are your four? What, what was that? Was that your, that was your that was, bottom was four? four. Mm -hmm. All right. So over to me. All right. So I'm going with, believe it or not, it's not because Bob's got this thing about thinking that I'm just this 
blockbuster summer freak who likes, you know, big bang explosions, which is true sometimes. When done properly, big bang explosions are great. But I'm going with a very small, contained German movie here. We might be punting, but it's not Das Boot. Okay. It's Der Untergang, no. or, as, or as you do know this, I promise you, you know this. The translation as it came across to us in England and in the States is Downfall. Don't know this. You one. haven't seen Downfall. So it's a German movie. It's essentially about the last 10 days of Adolf Hitler. And it's the claustrophobia in this movie is palpable. It's essentially starts off with him in the in the Reich Palace and ends the three quarters of the remaining movie are basically him in his underground bunker. Betrayed by Himmler, Goebbels in with him, his wife in with him, the kids in with him, the dog in with him. Goering gets killed in his Bavarian palace, a bomb. So it's literally the remaining SS and Nazi head honchos. And you're not meant to sympathize with it. And it's obviously a part of history that we all know, but it's a part of history that we should all see. Stellar performance from Bernd Schunz, who plays uh, Hitler. If that's one you should see. Okay. Really is. Downfall's a cracking movie. My next one, my number nine. <laughs> most people say you. <laughs> most people say you need a great leader to have a great army. Well, this movie says you need a great radio broadcaster. Cause I'm going. Good morning, Vietnam. This now you were talking about challenging what the conception of a war movie. I think is. both of your two choices would challenge it a bit. This isn't. It's exactly. It's not boom bang. It's. And it's Robin Williams unleashed in his typical ad lib fashion, but using Vietnam as a backdrop, the man, that wacky radio DJ, Adrian Croner, who gets off the plane and it shows his uh, maturation through being exposed to the Vietnam War. And it's a very, very interesting depiction of how both the morale of the soldiers is fucked with, for lack of a more eloquent word, but also how people are affected by war, sometimes for the better, without necessarily being exposed to the physical act of war itself. So, what did you have in mind in that regard? Who, who are you? That oh, Robin last... Williams, that, that, oh, how, his, he's... how his character okay. develops. He comes on as this, you know, this East Coast American popular radio DJ. He gets exposed to war, he gets exposed to the local culture. It humanizes him. It completely humanizes yeah. him. He becomes a better man by living abroad and actually not only seeing how the locals are uh, conflicted and uh, uh, and the war affects them, but also how the army is affected. The fact that he's the one who's got to keep the morale up. He's given the sheets of what he can and can't say every morning and it gets to the end where he's like, bullshit, I'm just right. gonna tell the, tell the truth. Right. You know, and then he's not happy about the fact that he's being censored. And then Forrest Whitaker, who makes one of his early appearances in this, ends up taking him in a Jeep to three trucks of troops who are about to go to, uh, to one of the main battle sites. Mm -hmm. And he uses him to spark up the troops and says, see, look, you do make a difference here. Just because you're not doing the fighting doesn't mean that your impact on this war isn't huge. Right. So it's a very understated war movie. My favorite scene in that film is, are the cheap laughs that you get when he has his Vietnamese class trying to pronounce English. No, it's fucking great. Right. Yeah. It's and great. Bruno Kirby's great in that too. Yeah. It's his foil. Yeah. yeah, good movie. But I mean, my favorite scenes in that. Did you know that like in Aladdin, uh, I mean, I'm a sucker for Robin Williams. Regular viewers will know this. And again, check out the top 10 Robin Williams movies which we filmed last week. It's a tearjerker. But this when he goes ad lib. I mean, in Aladdin and in Good Morning Vietnam, something like 90% of what he did on the radio was ad libbed. Uh, it's incredible. Good morning, Vietnam. Is that too loud? Well, it's too late. Tell the tells about the time. It's hot. It's damn hot. How hot is it, Tom? It's hot. It's so hot I could cook an egg in my pants. The nang me, the nang me. The yeah, nang me, the nang me. There you go. It's, it's I a, saw that film. It's a great. Oh, you I saw did. that one? I Funny did. that, because I'm a bit more mainstream than your choices, <laughs> aren't I? I? I believe I was in high school, but I did see it. Well, my next one, I know you haven't seen because we've had banter about it. This film is so close to being a documentary, but it is. Firefight after firefight. It is battle after battle. There are no heroes in this movie. It's just grunts. Hamburger Hill. It's, I think the only actor who ever became something out of this was Don Cheadle. But this, I think, was his first role. And spoiler alert, no heroes in this. Most of the guys in this movie, you won't know the name of, and they don't make it to the end of the movie. This movie shows, in a very contained manner, a group of misfit, archetypal berets trying to completely mismatch, trying to take over the famous Hill 893. 
aka Hamburger Hill. It's just a bloody field of death and murder and carnage. The Vietnamese are stuck in at the top. There's no way of gaining an advantage here. But essentially, they don't. I mean, it's it's all hiding on to nothing. This movie, and the the, the lack of familiarity you have with the characters, that uh, removal that you have, and that that lack of interaction and empathy you have with any of them. That's why I mean, it's so close to being a documentary. It may as well be something you see on the History Channel. There's no hero here. It's just dead, dead, one die after another, and it it's written by a Vietnam War vet whose name escapes me, but. It's all it's meant to do is show, this is what the Vietnam War was like. This is, there's no glory here. There's no machismo. People fight, people die. Docudrama. Docudrama. It's basically a docudrama, but not. Check it out. I will. And we've got one more from me, don't we? Oh, okay, yeah. Sean Penn. It's not the one you think. Can I guess? Go. Casualties of War. Yes, sir. Is it on your list? No. It, oh, cas is that Brian De Palma? I think it was, think you it know. I think it was Brian De Palma. This, oh, this is one of those movies that, you know, you only ever need to see once. I mean, unless there's, you got issues out there. But I mean, it focuses on a group of... Uh, privates who essentially take I'm um, gonna try Chanty One which they uh, raid a local Vietnamese village and take this girl essentially for lack of a better word as their sex slave and this movie just shows the complete fucking dehumanization that war can cause people Michael um, Michael J Fox is essentially the guy who we're supposed to relate to he's the hero but even at the end when he exposes what the troops have done, it still leaves a bad fucking taste in your mouth. He's done the right thing, but somehow they make it look like he's the bad guy when they've been the one raping and killing this guy. It's vile. But it's done in such a way that you would think, I wouldn't not believe that. I would believe it. Nothing to add? Because I know you've seen this movie. <sighs> uh, no, I think you've described it pretty well. Um, and as you said, seen it only once. Yeah. So, and Sean Penn is a name that's going to come up a couple of times. A couple? On this list. Mm -hmm. I know he's coming up once on yours, but... Come <laughs> <on>. <laughs> All right, over to you. All right. Um, my, so this is my number... Six. Six. Yes, sir. Recent film. 21st Century. Okay. Lone Survivor. Yeah, Mark In, Wahlberg? Mark Wahlberg. You're putting I, that on your top ten. This is, is a, that good, huh? I did. I thought it was good. I thought it was quite good. It, did it, Michael Bay make this? No, it's Peter no, Berg. No, he made the 33, Peter didn't Berg, he? Peter Berg. Um, I think the reason that it's on, I mean, one of the reasons I'm teaching the course that I'm teaching is because I enjoyed it so much when I saw it and then I was really suspicious of the reasons that I enjoyed it. You uh -huh. know, and, and, as, with a lot of things. I mean, I'm here because I love war films, but I hate war. How is that possible? This is one of those movies. Yeah. What it does a really nice job of is creating uh, I've heard it described as a rock video about war, and <laughs> uh, fair enough. But one of the things that it does is, is it focuses Emil Hirsch and and Mark Wahlberg and um, the Greek actor whose name is escaping me. Um, but one of the things that I like about it is it, it, we we focus so much on the camaraderie and on mm -hmm. the moral choice that the main character makes when he encounters. What, what you know when you're in theater in Afghanistan, you don't know who's a civilian and who's a combatant. It's one of the no. one of the uh, one of the great quandaries of contemporary warfare, especially guerrilla or terrorist warfare. As you don't know, nobody's really a civilian, nobody's really a combatant. It was also an issue for people fighting in Vietnam, um, and so it f doesn't focus on the big issues of the American enterprise in um, you know in Afghanistan. It's about these four or five soldiers and, mm -hmm. and their attempt to uh, survive. Um, and I found they it- They get cornered off essentially in this forest, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, what happens is a goat herder, uh, they're, they're, they have one mission to, to assassinate one terrorist leader. Right. They identify him at the close of the first day. They're gonna get picked up the next day. All they have to do is sort of make it through the night, kill him and get out. Yep. But they are, they are uh, spotted by a group of civilian, they think civilian goat herders. Right. And they have to choose, are they going to let him go or are they going to kill him to make sure he's silent? Everybody in the squad chooses to assassinate him or kill him, except the main character played by Wahlberg, who thinks, who knows it's a violation of the Geneva Convention and that they have to let him go. 
And it's a fucking grey area, that Geneva Convention, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, Don't you know, well, well if, if we, civilians, should we abide by these rules if the terror if our terrorist uh, opponents don't yeah, exactly and, and that's kind of what happens in the film but it's it's quite and the, the, a lot of a lot of valiant you know incredibly violent in some ways and not only gunfights and things like that but um very incredibly affecting um scenes and, and wounds and things like that um, so i thought it was a great great movie haven't seen it I, do you know what it, the only thing the the concept really interested me do you know what put me off about it you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. No, you should see but it. What put me off seeing it was Mark Wahlberg. He's quite good because he's not playing. It's as you know, the issue with with we've talked about this too. The issue with Hollywood actors is that very often, um, and you know, I've thought about this. I could have easily had Fury here, which I think Fury is, is fucking great. A great that, movie, and it's a place where Brad Pitt is not just playing Brad Pitt. He's no, actually he's playing War Daddy, and as in opposed this case, to Aldo Reigns and right. the Inglorious Bastards. Right, exactly, which is not on my list. No, oh my. But I, but I think that. Um, I think that the the thing that makes this Wahlberg's performance solid is that he's playing, and the guy, the 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 soldier, his name is escaping me. Um, he he really becomes that character rather than merely playing mm -hmm. Mark Wahlberg, which I think he does in The Gambler and in you know uh, what's the movie about the teddy bear? Oh, Ted, I like that. Yeah, yeah but he's there. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's but playing, he plays yeah, Mark Wahlberg. Hollywood yeah. actors often franchise themselves The Rock. You know, that he's just he, in every movie. He's the Rock. De Niro. Yeah, that uh, he's on my list. Um, but heroes on your lips. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Mm -hmm. You just wait. It's De Niro's on the other. I know, I know, I know. It's, I know. Yeah, it's a yeah. Vietnam movie. It is. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, movie yeah, about yeah, camaraderie. Yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah, one yeah. of the things war films gives us because, again, it's like friendship under yeah, in, under I know extreme, exactly the one you mean. Yeah, so, it's just clicked. Yeah. So that's my number six. Yeah. All right, over to you, or do I? Do no, 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 no. Your number five. Okay, my number five is. The one that really, for me, it starts my course and it really kind of turns the corner on films like Green Brain, studio war films. Apocalypse Now. Oh, we're punting. Punt, 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 punt. Okay. Big punt. Uh, over to your number four. The Deer Hunter with Robert De Niro. Didn't make my list. Well, I think, I think, it's I mean, think about the cast. Yeah. De Niro. Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. Um, not John Voight. Uh, my, what's See, his? that's my point. Um, the reason it's um, is because essentially I just can't remember the names of the characters. Yeah, but no actor. one can. This movie starts. Meryl Streep. Okay, fine. You remember but that the, name? Yeah, okay. I remember that name. Mm -hmm. But the movie essentially starts and stops with the Nero and Morgan. It's their chemistry. It's the build up of their no, relationship. It's, it's and John it's the Hurd. Is the, John Hurd is the guy's name. And when he, the most affecting scene for me. Okay, there's the roulette scene with Walken, which which you, is, which you could take as oh, an outtake. The end. And at yeah, the end or, no, I'd say that the. the the middle of the end, the end of the middle of the film, but the the most powerful scene for me, and I watched it when I was probably twelve or thirteen years old mm. the first time, um, was when Heard lets go of the strut of the helicopter and lands in the in the riverbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is deep, it badly badly injured, and that was just such an affecting scene. But also the the roulette scene, the deer hunting scene at the beginning with De Niro. De Niro's character, the love affair with Meryl Streep, a young beautiful. Do you know, it's Meryl been Streep. so long since I've seen the Deer Hunter, and it's. One of those films where I look back and I would only rewatch it for the roulette scene. The rest of the movie didn't leave. Maybe I watched it when I was too I, well, young, I mean, but it didn't you know, make the, a the, the American, impression. The depiction of the American steel town, you know, these things that, you know. Yeah, uh, it went over my head. I think because I don't have any rapport with that. If I was living in Sheffield in a steel industry, I might have more rapport with it. But uh, the roulette scene is the scene, obviously. Yeah. It's, well, that's the one that certainly has, it's, it kind of made Walken's career. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, we, we I, I do and it's, love you know, that it's, scene. And it's I De Niro not playing De Niro. a gangster, not playing a New Yorker. You know, there's a lot of things about this film that are great. No, that's true. There's, but I mean, like I said, the only thing I can clearly remember is uh, the is that roulette scene in Vietnam. Yep. Because then I talked about that with my, I think, with my class the other day, which is that. Did he? I don't. I don't know if it was someone <laughs> from our class. It wasn't a class as a whole, but talking about the idea that you know why is this why is this emblematic or metaphoric this scene? It's because there are three stages you go through uh, as a soldier. Mm -hmm. The first one is um, uh, I'm gonna. I'm such a good soldier that I'm gonna survive on my on my cunning and on my ability. Yeah. Then the second stage is uh, that doesn't really matter. 
uh, I'm going to pray and stay in my foxhole, mm -hmm. and that's how I'll survive. And the final stage is, it's a total crapshoot. It doesn't matter what I do, that if I win or, win or, or if I live or die, it really is really a matter of roulette, rolling the dice, spinning the chamber on the pistol. Yep. And so that's that's where he is psychologically by the end of his tour. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good metaphor for what soldiers go through, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, even not looking at the metaphor itself, even looking at the act as a physical act within the movie, it's an incredible scene. Yeah, yeah. Have we talked about any actresses in this entire show yet? I mean, the war film, this is one of the reasons that... that um, ah! Tran Punt? T1. Tran T1 in Casualties of War. Yes, okay, fair enough. But she's thoroughly objectified, destroyed, But that's murdered. the point. Yes, but I think there has to be other ways to, to depict women in, in the, the scene in the theater of war. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty was so important. Well, because it, it was, as well as that, they also had a female director, didn't that's they? That's Catherine yeah. Bigelow, yeah. right, Catherine exactly. Bigelow, right. But, but it's so, it, this, this genre has been so for those dominated. of you who don't know those, Catherine Point Break Bigelow, that woman. Right. But these have been, so she had to make that moneymaker before she could actually get the chance to make, and to, to crack the glass ceiling on, on war films is a big deal. That wasn't meant to be a moneymaker, though, Point Break. It was a Keanu Reeves film, and what was it about? He wasn't Keanu Reeves yet, so to speak. I think that was an indie film, Point Break. Hmm. I actually really, that's, that's a... I hate Point Break. Oh man, that is a movie that I, that's a guilty pleasure. I'm guilty like. pleasure another, I can go that's with. That's another day. Do you know what, that... Glory if, Petty. If anyone, because I know there's people out there who rave about Brody. Keanu Reeves. Brody. Uh, oh, I hate Keanu Reeves. Okay. I'm with, no, I'm with, no, 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 I'm with you. Fuck it, I'm with you. Comment below if you disagree with me. But if anyone wants to go have have a Pepsi challenge with me about he's a good actor. Watch Point Break. That scene when he approaches Patrick Swayze is, is when he approaches Patrick Swayze on the beach and goes, "You're going down." It's like stop, just, Johnny Utah. Just stop, Johnny oh, Utah. Johnny fucking scarecrow. He's terrible. That was your number four, right? Uh, I think I think I had to skip number five. Yes. Yeah, no, number three. Kirk Douglas again. What? Paths of Glory. I've never seen it. That is a Kubrick. That's Kubrick's first movie, 1957. Oscar winner, movie? unless I'm... Yes. Kubrick's first film <gasps> made his career. The French Military, which should matter to you. And starring, starring uh, Kirk Douglas. And it's about... Uh, uh, in, in, in the same ways that, that, uh, one of my, that my number one film deals with these themes and issues it's about courage yeah, i'm giving you that back courage, right now but i'm courage leadership true courage <laughs> true leadership etc foolhardy foolhardy military leadership and and the lack of respect for the sacrifice that grunts make in, in favor of military either military um um just a small or... disclaimer everyone i wasn't blowing raspberries at him there for the current movie he's talking about <laughs> i know what his number right. one is this is what brought the this is what brought this him why we're here to the show today yeah. is a huge disagreement over what his number one is. We'll get to that. But the raspberry was to the number one, not to Paths of Glory. Please continue. Uh, just that uh, be beautiful, uh, just you, you need to see it. Black and white, 1957, Stanley Kubrick. What else do you need to know? Kirk Douglas. No, sold. Stanley yeah. Kubrick and Kirk Douglas, I'm sold. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really the, the first film and, and it made his career. It gave him the opportunity to make all those other great films. He's, he'll, be, he'll appear again on my list as well. I'm yeah. really glad oh. to hear it because yeah. he's on my list as well, yeah. old Stanley. May he rest in peace. Another uh, another American who spent most of his life in England. Did he really? Yes. After he became Stanley Kubrick, he came to England. That would explain why he shot some of the movie that I'm going to talk about later, why he shot it here in the UK. Uh, so, okay, my number six. I also know you haven't seen this one, and it's one I've been telling you for ages to see. This one breaks the convention of all movies because it's a fucking animated movie. Grave of the Fireflies. Oh, Jesus Christ. The saddest movie. Japanophile? No, no. But great, you are. great Japanophile, but great movieophile. Oh, okay. This, oh, oh my fucking God. From uh, Studio Ghibli, the, the powerhouse company from uh, Japanese filmmaking, and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. Holy God, if there was ever a movie that's so great that you have to see it, but that is so sad that you only ever have to see it once, it essentially happens seconds before the Hiroshima bomb goes off. Well, not seconds, minutes before the Hiroshima bomb goes off. A mother gives a young son, an even younger sister to look after. Says, run. 
Get the fuck out of here. Now, obviously, this is a movie and it's also an animated movie, so you have to suspend disbelief partially, because obviously there's no getting away from a mushroom cloud's radius. That part is where you suspend disbelief, because the aftermath of, of picking up, not even picking up, because he doesn't pick it up, but of being indoctrinated by the Empire of Japan, by the fact that he's got to keep his head held high, by the fact that he's a kid and everyone is basically scrabbling for anything they can get after the Hiroshima bomb in, that, in Hiroshima, Japan. The fact that his aunt is robbing from him when he's got his first job and he decides to leave her. The fact that he's then got to somehow provide for his younger sister. And it is just the nicest person in the world doing everything they can to save someone who's incapable of looking after themselves and ultimately fucking failing. And it just, it, it, the, the, the air gets kicked out of you in this movie. It is just so gut-wrenching to think that things like this probably did happen. And I think the only reason this was made in the animated format is just no studio would fucking touch this if it was made in any other way. It's too out there. It's gut-wrenching. And I know, probably for you lot in St. Lawrence and probably for the Silver Screen fans out there, I know that so few people watch First off, Japanese movies, and even fewer people watch animations because, quote unquote, they're for kids. Please take that concept, that misconception out of your head. Anime, when done like Studio Ghibli do, is one of the most powerful fucking forms of movie telling. But it has to be done properly. And this movie, just go see it. Please go see it. And make sure if you see it, it's with the subtitles. Don't watch it dubbed because you'll lose a lot of the meaning. You need to see it subtitled. Saddest movie ever made that you only ever need to see once. And Dickhead here has seen it twice. Dickhead. <laughs> dickhead. <laughs> Sold? You thinking about I've, I've seeing that one? one? Yes, yes. Okay, so my number five. I think you'll find that I have generally more respect for your choices than you do for mine. Just no, I have it. respect for all of yours other than your number one, Bobby, but we'll one. get to that. Right. Right. We'll get to that. My number five is a Stanley Kubrick film. That's like film. saying, I like all your ex-girlfriends, but I hate your wife. Isn't Pretty it? much, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Just saying. Yeah, just, that's fine. I like all your girlfriends, but I hate your wife. There you go. All right. That's Who's fine. your wife? What's oh, your we're playing that list? game, are we? <laughs> I'm going to hate it, whatever it is. It is gonna hate. Uh, my number five is a Stanley Kubrick movie. Uh, it is it about. It is about. Punt. All right, let me drop the title. It's Full Metal Jacket. Punt. Really, we're punting. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. He's oh, you approve of my choices? I'm have... so excited. <laughs> I feel so vindicated now. The snob is not a snob. No, the snob is a snob. Kubrick is in, is for a Hollywood director, for a director who had anything to do with Hollywood, he's up there among the real auteurs and the real great oh, American God, film yeah. directors. So, yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a, a great film. But we, we're going to talk about it. Full Metal Jacket, we'll talk about it in a bit. My number four is, uh, I mean, I know you hate this movie. I know you hate it. No, 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 no. It, get, the palm door stays with me. I know you hate this movie, but I'm telling you right now, the first 45 minutes of this film are unrelenting, are horrifying, are unfucking matched, unrivaled, unparalleled, and are some of the greatest moments of modern day cinema ever made. Saving Private Ryan. Really? What? No reaction? You I mean, stoic I, I motherfucker! Think, I think that I think that they they are you know the incredible representation of film of, of war violence, but it but you know it's it's the rest of the movie. No, it's not. Just hold on to your ah hand there. Uh, John Bigonet, who was one of my college professors, wrote an article in the for the Atlantic. When the, the thesis of the article is how can the first forty five minutes be so great and the rest of it be so such a cliche, such a warm. You've cliche. missed the fucking point of the movie, Professor. I don't think that I have. I think, allow me to attempt to educate the educated. <laughs> okay. The first 45 minutes of this movie, we both agree, are great. That, that, there's, that's, you've just raised that point and... and well, in, in the way, they're, they're photo... Re they're, they're like photo realism. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I wasn't... I mean, I st this movie made such an impact on me. I still remember where I was when I watched this and the fucking year it was. I was in Thailand, I was watching it with 
my parents who'd rent, who had stayed in a hotel called Bang Tao Beach Chalet. I had my own chalet there and we got some, again, sorry, we're in Thailand, you get fake DVDs there, but we got a load of fake DVDs. Pirate. Pirate, yeah. And we put on, I put on Saving Private Ryan, hearing about it, not knowing at all what it was about. I had my knees up to my chest going, what the fuck am I watching? That first 45 minutes is so difficult to watch, but we're talking about the 45 minutes beyond that. Now, this is what I think is interesting. It seems to be, as you love to call it, a platitude dealing with the personal loss of one man and why- I gotta say one thing to you, earn this. <laughs> You've got, you're talking about what you like to call a platitude. It's one man's loss. Okay. The movie is a juxtaposition from one end to the other. Tell me a single one of the soldiers, privates, lieutenants, captains' names in that first 45 minutes. There are none. Up them. No, you don't. Yeah, you know it after that battle's happened. The L Omaha landing is shot in. Up fuck em. off. Up them right here. Up them. That first 45 minutes is shot in a way so that they are all nameless. There are no names. There is no captain this or private that. It's nameless. It's almost like Hamburg Hill. It's like a documentary. And afterwards, it both shows the casualties of war on a carnage level. And it also shows just as valid, because we're all selfish human beings at our base. Why is one man's struggle worth uh, worth more than millions, but why is the millions more significant to that one man than the loss that he's incurred? It's a perfect juxtaposition between personal loss and global catastrophe. I think I, I, I think that it you don't need to watch that movie to I think you watch any of the 50 years of, of World War II films that came before it and get the same. That's I think the argument that Professor Bigonet makes is that it, it resorts because it's Steven Spielberg because he always seems to do that. That he goes for he, he's so afraid of, of doing anything really bad. Look I would take, you, okay. I as, think, as I a think writer Fury, you Fury need... is 10 times better than Incorrect. Than as, a, as a writer in my opinion. Yeah, I know that and you're I in charge of my I, opinion uh, but mm -hmm. I think yeah. Fury's mm -hmm. a lot better. Listen, well, War Daddy, give me War Daddy over over Tom Hanks. Character I think you're anyway. wrong. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that you're putting, oh God, you're putting the artist before the art. I'm doing the opposite. The art has to come before the artist. What do you mean I'm putting? I don't. Let me I give think you an example. Fury is a better let film. Me, the film no, is no, better. No, no, no. You, pre your Fury argument, you were talking about it's Spielberg, so therefore it's sentimental. Well, he makes. And, I, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, do I'm, do okay. I talk like that? Okay, sorry. Silver it's, Spiel, it's Spielberg. It is, that is much more like. <laughs> yeah. like. Listen, the fact of the matter is, the way, the same way that you've got a high on a certain director, I also have a high on Spielberg. All right. He, he, we're not going to go into my liking of Spielberg and your disliking of him, but the fact of the matter is, is that you're giving Ryan hatred because of the fact that it was made by Spielberg. I guarantee you, if that movie was made by Kubrick, Coppola, Nolan, or Malick, you'd be singing a different tune. Frame for frame, the same movie. Nico, that movie rubs you up the wrong way because it's Nico, Spielberg. T tell me I lived a good life. No, shut up. <laughs> tell me, tell me I lived. Birdshot. Bird shot, nature shot, we'll explain soon. Look, a crocodile in a fucking truck. Tell because that a... makes the movie advance. Here, let's pat the crocky on the head. Tell me I lived a good life. Heard this. Sorry. Moving on. All right, is it me now? I think it's you. All right. Fucking crocodile. I'll explain My soon. number two, right? That's where we are now. Full it's... metal jacket. Yeah. Uh, Hang on, wait, 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 no! Oh, fuck it, we'll go with it. I have my number three, but we'll go with your number two. Go for it. No, no, who's your number three? My number three was from my dearly beloved great-grandmother who passed away a few years ago. This was her favorite movie. And God damn it, it's one of my favorite war movies. Not just because it was her favorite, but because it genuinely is a fucking great movie. It's The Great Escape. Starring? Starring, oh God. <laughs> it's a long list. Steve but McQueen, principally... Richard Attenborough, James Garner, Charles Bronson, Angus Lenny. Uh, Maximilian... Shell? Shell, thank you. It, the, what a cost. Well, it was, that was the era at the, that was, it was to get the big ensemble cast and try to spread the story across. Yeah, but God, it was good. Different main characters. God, yeah, it no, it's, good. it's a good movie. I think your number one's a bit guilty of that too, just to be honest. Yeah, no, I think it, it, the, the interesting thing is that th that's a huge cast where a lot, lot of the performances end up on the cutting room floor in the service, in the larger service of the film. It's not the testament to the movie. 
you're the one who brought it up. You're the one who's obsessed. <laughs> yeah, you're actually more obsessed with my top movie than I am. I am because you're I more hate obsessed it with my wife so I much. Yeah, I hate right. it so much. But no, the the Great Escape. I mean, put it this way: if the Nazis knew the type of trouble they were going to get into when they got these POWs in this supposedly inescapable camp, they would have thought twice. This group of essentially war war criminal, not war criminal, but prisoners, prisoner of war, escape artists go through every single trick in the book to get out of this supposedly inescapable camp. And it's a true story and fucking hell, they manage. I mean, sadly things don't end well. I don't want to say how, go watch it. It's worth a watch and I don't well, want to give any- movie, It's yeah. a war movie, so things obviously don't end well, but the thinking that goes into Mom the escape Dagger, plan, the Tom, yeah. Dick and Harry of everything. I mean, it's, it's, and do you know what? It's not just the overall story. It's the little moments in this movie that matter. All of us have done the Steve McQueen bouncing the ball off the wall. And don't tell me a single one of you has not heard that theme and, and sung it in your head. See, you're doing it now. It's no fantastic. I, it's have, fantastic. I, have, I, have, I have respect for your choices. Except for Saving Private Ryan, I don't. Well, understand. you're wrong. That's but I use it in my class because I think it's important. It is. Especially considering. And to the, to the alum, it's not alumni, is it? To the students of St. Lawrence. They aren't alumni yet. They're not alumni. In fact, alumni. they're in their first semester. To the first semesters as is, is, of St. Lawrence. I hope Professor tells you also that people walked out of Saving Private Ryan, not because it's a bad movie, but because the war veterans who saw it had such a hard time watching it because it evoked the reality of all. And well, you, when you know, you hope I tell them, when you have your college course, you can tell your students that. Maybe I, no, that's my objection is not to the, I, I wouldn't say that it isn't, um, uh, that it doesn't have a photorealistic, in, in the same, like a photorealistic attempt to depict war, but as a, as a work of art and a work of narrative storytelling, it has to do more than that. And one of the things that I think it, it doesn't, I think it, it sends a sentimental message about sacrifice for country things that that i think my number one film challenges ironically <laughs> it came out at the same i mean it came out in fact we'll wait for number one we really will because we're gonna i mean we're, we're gonna run over time but that's fine um we can do an extended episode here but yeah th so you're number two my number full two metal is jacket. Full metal jacket. Yeah, let's talk Shot right here in London, in parts. Incredible, huh? Uh, a lot of people wonder, here's a bit of trivia about it. A lot of people wonder why it feels like two movies. You have, you follow Private Joker through basic training. Yeah. And um, and then you, then you actually have, there's a significant kind of break time-wise. Yeah, the latrine. Yeah, and then, right. And then you are in uh, Way City with him and the, and the unit. And you meet up with a lot of characters that he went to basic with. And it was all shot in the London docks. Yeah. <laughs> Right, uh, but that's because the source text, which was a novel by a um, U.S. serviceman, it was a, a two, it was a novella consisting of two different stories, uh, or a book consisting of two different novellas, one of which took place in Basic, and one of which took place actually in theater in Vietnam. So oh, Kubrick, which is a strange choice for a mm. director, to rather than to try to what a lot of them sort of blend the stories together, there's a terrible movie out there called. Uh, Stories from the Life of a Young Man, which was the, a director's attempt to take 17 different Ernest Hemingway stories and make one movie of them to give it narrative continuity yeah. and place in the context of one life. So he doesn't try to do that. Kubrick was, you know, he was a, a cutting edge kind of director. And he really was. He did push the boundaries. Yeah. What I it has the, my favorite, my favorite line of dialogue in that movie. Uh, oh, about, but pick about, one. <laughs> no, about America. There's so many good ones, but about American sort of American foreign policy at the time. He said, oh, they said, J Private Joker, why did you? You know, enlist. Why did you sign up? Yeah, 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 yeah. He says, "Well, I wanted to go to far, or halfway around the world, and encounter people from a different civilization, an ancient civilization, yeah. and kill them." Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and it's just devastating, but probably missed it by is. the reporter. No, so, it is. But I mean, what, what I find so fascinating. Where is it on your list? It was my number five. Okay. Now, I I love this movie. It's one of my favorite. Um, I'm. I mean, I'm hesitating switching, no looking at my list. I'm hesitating switching it between that and The Great Escape because I do love Full Metal Jacket. But what I find so fascinating about this film is the fact that the training, which is obviously one of the highlights of the movie, it's, it's meant to be, you know, from, from, from a neutral outside perspective, it's this is how US soldiers are made. But I think it was so brave by Kubrick to show the psychological fucking torture that these men who are willing to don the stars and stripes are put through. And the, the irony is that the training on home soil, that's where their souls destroyed. But it's in Vietnam on the battlefield where Joker actually rediscovers his humanity. Well, Basic is supposed to be actually um, 
where the military tears you down and rebuilds you in its image to serve its purpose. Tears that's, you down, but, and as point. he says, there's a famous line where he says, they're losing control of us, we're becoming more robotic, we're becoming more drilled. But that's just, I think, just touches the surface. It doesn't clearly show the full scale of how much they've just been, not crushed on an on a independent level, because they want to make you as non-independent as possible, obviously, to be, you know, a grunt, exactly right. that. But it, it, this soul-destroying torture you're put through, especially epitomized by Private Pal's bullying. I mean, yeah. th th there's no... And Ar Arlie Ermey, that's a career-making performance by oh, him. Before God, that, yeah. I think he was, he was... Maybe... This may be incorrect. I know that he served as a consultant on other films, mm. and it may have been hired originally as a consultant on this film, but sort of takes over that first, the first half of the film. I mean, uh, oh, he does. Uh, Matthew Modine is great, uh, and so is... Uh, who plays Pyle? Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio, right. But but Ermi really steals it. And, oh, he does. He and, steals the show. Completely. And then he's a guy who goes on playing himself. And then you, he has who, it. And the, one of the bold ones is a numb, that. isn't he? I'm pretty I, sure it's that. I it's don't remember. Pretty the private animal, animal lover, whatever he's called. That's one of the bold ones. Oh, wins. right, right, right. Adam Baldwin. Adam Baldwin. That's the one. But yeah, yeah it's a fucking incredible movie. It really Great. is. I mean, it, it, it falls in the tradition of, of Vietnam War movies of the 80s that had terrific 60s soundtracks that brought yeah. off. Paint It Black is, I think, played in that film. Paint It Black's on uh, it. Me Love You Long Time. Uh, you know, uh, you Alabama keep Black saying, Snake. You on and keep on and on with the taglines from yeah, that. It's yeah, it's great. But, um, oh, I, but these boots are made for walking Tina Sinatra. Yeah. yeah. And the way it all ends with them walking over the battlefield singing M I C K U I M O U S E, it's 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 so harrowing, isn't yeah. it? It's yeah. work of art, yeah. absolute work of art. So, my number two we punted for was uh, Apocalypse Now. We just watched that last week in my class. Oh, fuck, it's good. It's good, and it's Ooh. you know it's it's. it's did you we, watch the full four hour Redux? Yes, yes, we did. Good. They, so they're great. Which has the French scene in it around the French yes. table. Yeah, yes. good, good, good. But good, you good. know, it, it, interestingly, it's it's you know based on Heart of Darkness by Joseph, Joseph Conrad. Conrad, and it's about a descent of a character. And actually, we talked about as you go through the film, as like, you go through people, the river, as, as they get farther away from civilization, they become more and more deranged yeah. and demented. Uh, it's the opposite of Saving Private Ryan. It's killing Colonel Kurtz. It's it at the films. One film has a, a, a life urge. The other film, Saving Private Ryan. The, no. and, and that to me is especially in the context of a war film is a bit sentimental. It, it is very Spielberg. But whereas, but, but you wait, say wait, that let me finish, finish the bad finish. thing. No, I, yeah, because I think that uh, to me, to my mind, based on what you just said about Kubrick, mm -hmm. it's it, you know, and Coppola has the same feeling that war is a descent into madness and into the worst parts of ourselves. That is an interpretation of war. It's not the interpretation of war. I, and I think that interpretation has a lot to do with where you and I are going to where the films fall on our list. But uh, you know, Apocalypse Now is is a great film. I think. But the second film we watched was Platoon, which isn't on either of our yeah. lists. And, Machismo and I, bullshit. Yeah, well, it's he's settling. I mean, one of the things about Stone that you see is he's settling some very personal scores with these films. Which and, is why he made running three rough of shot them. Over, run, running rough shot over history in order to do it. Uh, Apocalypse Now is very much about... It's set... I, I think it's it's interestingly set... It uses Vietnam as its... As its Backdrop. Theater, backdrop, but it's really about it, if it's it's about the human soul, right? It's not right. really about war. It's set in a war time, but this could just as easily. Have, Sheen is great in it. Sheen is he great. Almost loses his mind. He Marlon Brando's great. Fucking Dennis Hopper's incredible in it. And a, in a, admittedly, Lawrence in a cameo. Fishburne is great. Cameo, but a, a very limited but, supporting role. Yeah, but you're, you're Fishburne's fourteen years old at the 17. time of filming. No, he's fourteen at the time I of filming. Look it, was it 17, up. But look it up. 14. You know what, that scene when Dennis Hopper comes down and goes, "Yeah, you know, man, he he was just going out of his mind, man, and you know, he just sometimes loses right. control, man. He was high off the mother. They all were high and, and drunk. I mean, it's Coppola was just like, keep rolling. Shoot, right. no, shoot, that's, shoot. The scene with the scene with Martin Sheen, the first few minutes of that film are all. Oh, when he's on his bed, spooled yeah, he's out. absolutely yeah, yeah. dead drunk, and he yeah. tried to kill Coppola. Yeah. Um, but the Coppola wouldn't let them turn the cameras off. Um, and Timothy Bottoms is great in that film, and the uh, Harrison he, Ford makes an early appearance. Does, uh, I think, and it's. Uh, what's the the performance that I was just going to refer to? And you've thrown me off with Harrison Ford. Um, oh, K Colonel Kilgore. Um, Robert Duvall, who almost oh, wins Duvall, the Oscar based yeah, on like yeah, seven yeah, yeah, minutes yeah, yeah. I love the smell of Vietnam. I love the smell so of Vietnam 18. in the morning. Yeah, it's great. Hey. Uh, PA. PA. Interruption again. Research assistant. 14. Mm -hmm. uh, he told Coppola he was 16. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clean. 
So, yes, admittedly, I mean, just one of the things about that film is, again, it helped Hollywood turn the corner. It made a lot of these other films possible because it was willing, I think, to break through some some cliche barriers about war movies yeah. and depict war in a way that was, um, in some ways, depict war by not depicting it. As a student of mine in the course wrote in a paper, um, we don't see... We see almost no Vietnamese combat, enemy combatants yeah. in this film. You see the napalm they're, they're bombing on the themselves. beach. You yeah. see the, the river crossing when they're going from one side of the bridge to the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see the impact that it's had on the French who colonized that little part of the river. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that movie could just as easily have been set in the Belgium Congo, just like in Conrad's book. I mean, <laughs> forgive With me, people but people firing blindly into the into yeah, the forest. The, I mean, the that's the only thing that sets it apart is the Playboy models. Yeah, it's an imperial. <laughs> it's a story of an imperial army really at war with itself, with its own heart. And I think that that allows the same. A lot of that is, and that's what uh, to refer to platoon, which again isn't on the list. Um, that's what Chris Taylor, Private Chris Taylor, realizes when he's on the helicopter back home. That really we were at war. It was, it was a battle between the two sergeants, and they're really at war with themselves. I mean, the thing that I actually find incredible about it is that Martin Sheen's he's warned at the beginning, isn't he? When they're briefing him, they say to him, "All men have their breaking point." You do, I do, Kurt's broke. And he doesn't he doesn't take that on board. He doesn't he almost defies his superior by not listening to him, but as he's going down the river, he does not take on board that he has been warned. You're going to a dark place. You are going. Take the title from Conrad's novel. So you are going respect, to the very heart of darkness. Vietnam, I mean, it's just he, he takes Heart of Darkness and he, he changes, he updates the context for a contemporary audience. Yep. But the story, the core of the story, and I would make, the, I will make this argument about my number one film, the core of the story, <laughs> the, the principles about which the, around which the film revolves is, is the same. The heart is the same in Heart of Darkness and of an Apocalypse Now. It just happens to be set in Vietnam. I think, for example, that Full Metal Jacket is really about Vietnam. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I, I mean, do too. In, I in, in, in a way that, that. that Apocalypse Now is not. I'd agree with you on that. Um, yeah. We've agreed. Oh so we should write that down. Fuck me. Let's go on. Say your number one. Do I, do I have to say first? Why don't you have to say first? Go Thin on. Red Line. <laughs> Terrence Malick. Bullshit. Hashtag. Let me, worst. See. Let me see. Hold on. Hold yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Hold please, on. please Hold get on. it up. Uh, seven Oscar nominations. Seven. Didn't including only it? one. Nominations! For it didn't win shit. But the point is, it can't be a like a what did oh, 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 oh. Mr. Oscars are not a valid fucking form of no, gauging I'm, the I'm quality speaking, of a movie. When I do this, I'm speaking your language. It won the New York Critic Film Circle's best Ooh, picture. Slow clap for the nature documentary. Woody Harrelson sits on a grenade. I wow! Think, yeah, so I, 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 look, sorry, I well, mean, look, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. No, no, no. We are no. going. We are going into. No, this I'm now. no. I'm going to rise this, above your no, childish not. antics here. Oh, say, taking it's a, a great moral. Film. I am. I, I don't have to, I mean, I, I would commend your audience to watch this film. I recommend them not to. There you go. No, 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 no. no I'm no. not going to give you what you want. Look at you. You're losing it. I'm not going to give it to this you. This isn't a battle. Who's in the cast? Who's in the cast? Uh, Jared Leto, Elias. Oh, Jared Leto. I'm sure you'd leave that because he's the Joker. Uh, Elias Cotiès. Yes. Uh, Nick, Nick Nolte. Nolte. Um, John Travolta. Clooney. John Travolta. Yeah, that's a cameo from Clooney. Um, yes. Uh, Adrian Brody. It, yeah. Uh, ben Chaplin. Woody Harrelson. Who you Woody mentioned? Woody Harrelson. Um, there's more. Uh, Jim can, Caviezel. Can, now, do you know what annoys me about all this, right? Is that you've been saying more than once on this very episode that about uh, redefining a war movie, mm -hmm. about t t changing what our conceptions of a war movie are, about not using big stars. Motherfucker, you've just listed I didn't, about anything. I didn't say anything about it that was bad to use big stars. If you could, no, stars not play, not necessarily just playing themselves. Sorry, Woody Harrelson plays himself. Fucking Nick Nolte plays the same role in that movie as he does in Warrior, as he does in fucking True Grit, as he does in every single Nick Nolte. He's gonna be with a rat. not. You gonna do grit. that Nick, for Nick me, Nolte's boy? Not in True Grit. Nick Nolte's not in True Grit. The new one he was? No, he's not. Yes, that's he uh, is. no, it's not. It's um, uh, that's Jeff Bridges. Sorry. Very good point, but he's the same in that as he is in every Nick he's Nolte movie. <laughs> it's not true. I Nick think... Nolte is Nick Nolte. You were talking about, you know, Robert De Niro breaking that archetype of being a Robert De Niro character. Nick Nolte is a Nick Nolte character in that. No, Nick Nolte plays... Sean Penn Nick is Nolte Sean Penn. Plays when, 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 when you see Field Marshal Fuchs in uh, Paths of Glory, you'll recognize 
McNulty's role. All um, the issues again, I... The, 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 the career army man who fails to see the humanity of the men he's sending into hopeless uh, battle. That's, that's what Nick Nolte does there. And I think, you know, I mean... Do you know why this he, movie bothered me to such a profound degree? Because I liked it. No, absolutely incorrect. If you think that, hashtag movie snob. The fact of the matter is, I didn't like this movie for two very clear reasons. I thought the filmmaking was so fucking sloppy in terms of, in, wait, 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 let me, sorry, that wrong word. The editing was so fucking ropey in this movie. The pacing was so bad. I don't know so what ropey means. Ro bad. Okay. Let's just keep it simple. The, pa the editing in this movie is bad. That's that's not a that's not even a personal preference. You can fucking study, be it online, be it in one of your classes. Study basic 101 editing, and you're gonna now maybe argue with them. Well, Malik wanted to break that convention, very possibly. Like but the he convention of good movie making. No, and by making a no, bad one. No, no, Bob. He broke. If you if you believe this, if you want to go with the moral high ground, if he broke editing convention to a poor fucking result, it didn't deliver a good result. I was with you at one stage, and every third shot, bird shot, crocodile shot, that, nature well, there, shot. Yeah, listen, What's I, that do for? you want me to tell you what I believe Please. to be Malik's reasoning there? One, one of the best reviews that I read of the film said. No, 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 no your belief. Now, first, I'm going to tell you what the review said because it because I, I, I this helped me understand. Um, it gave it articulated for me something that was already you know in in my response emotions to the film, but that. As with this case of, you know, the, the reason that the World War One movie, what the World War One film, Path of Glory, has in common with the, the world, this World War Two movie, um, is that it's asking the large questions about war, like what Which is are? leader, like what is leadership, like what, you know, like what's greater, the the military objective or the lives of the soldiers. That Saving kind of Private Ryan no, asks exactly the same yes, question. It answer, it get, but it answers in favor of the empire instead of in favor of the human soul. No, it doesn't. It does. Which is because, why they give him his mini just, mission. Just let me finish. It does because when he gives up, when his old men all give their lives so that that one soldier gets home, because they follow orders, and following orders ends up in that film being the right thing to do with him dying on the bridge, as opposed to the no, soldier. In, no, let me finish. And, oh, and the man. soldier in, in saving in um, Thin Red Line, uh, the, the, the captain says, "I'm actually not going to do that. I'm not going to send 50 You're men." Talking about Elias Cotius. Yes. yes. Yeah. He, I'm not going to send 50 men up this hill into uh, you know a heavily fortified Japanese machine gun nest in order for you to get, have the objective you want to have right away when we can devise a strategy whereby we can do that risking fewer men he's sent home see so that's a fucking platitude if ever there was one i'm going to be the hero and i'm going to be a hero in the most obvious lowest common denominator way by i care for my men i won't send my men into battle you talk about a sentimental no platitude. But you have the, no no listen let me, let me tell you what sentimentality is to me okay and this show is going to go way over time it's fine but Sentimentality means that we take something that's complicated and we reduce it and make it feel like something simple, which is what I think happens with Hank's character. Which I he think says, happens "Boy, I don't, I don't know what I, this. This feels. All my soldiers are, are revolting against the orders we've got, but I want to get home, so I'm going to do what I'm told." And it turns out being okay in the respect that he dies a good death on the bridge. No. He does one of those deaths where he gets to talk to you as he's bleeding out, right? Which is. F frankly, hard to believe, and I would say sentimental. It's he might as well have staggered around okay, the stage. Let me finish. That's like, fine. That's Shakespeare. fine. And then what you get, what you get in uh, in Malick's film is the same question, but such a complicated answer. It's and not it, it's a series. Fucking complicated. It's a series of arguments among several different key characters, in which the argument never gets resolved in a way that's satisfying, and it goes because on because it's you. a question that is unresolvable. Exactly, but that Spielberg doesn't make can't, it. Spielberg can't live with those. His audiences don't want those. His Incorrect. Audiences want those answers. Each of the directors just deals with it in a completely different yeah, way. Yeah, one by answering and the one by not. Malik completely answers it. What, prev not. what prevails in the Malik movie? There's not not an answer in the Malik movie. There is a resolution. Cotius gets sent home, Nolte gets the fucking glory. It's just a different take on exactly the but same fucking it's, question. It's how you feel about it. It's how the character, the audience, and not the character, but the audience feels about that question. Not how the plot resolves it or doesn't resolve it. Yes, the, it gets resolved in the sense that this yes. is a military hierarchy and he says you're, you're a liability as yeah. in command, you're going home. But the audience may not feel that that's been resolved for them. Whereas I think we are asked by Savit Prime and Ryan to accept that the, there was a larger the mother made a sacrifice of all of her children, right? And, and, and Hank sacrifices his life, and even though he's uneasy with it, 
Pr Private Ryan goes home and he has to say to his wife, "Tell me I earned this." Do that, you? That's a no, totally do, do, over the yeah. top cinema. Do you know why? Moment. Why is it that Ryan is given so little screen time in that movie? Because of because the it's fact Matt Damon. No. Oh. oh, that's bullshit. You like Matt Damon, eh. you cheeky bastard. No, not really. I like him better than Ben Affleck. You're fucking cutting me off and trying to throw me, and you're very good at it. But stop I'm it. I'm not. You're very good at it, but stop it. What you've just described in fucking Thin Red Line is exactly the same thing. Matt Damon, Ryan is given so little screen time because for the whole movie they are going against their own will to do this knowing it's not the right thing to do and we as an audience are on that mini mission with them we're on that journey with them wait we're not exposed to the full battlefield of Omaha Beach that's set and done we're now on this little mission with this group of guys who do not agree just like in Malik's movie they do not agree with the mission they've been given they bitch about it for the whole movie every single as following as they get picked off one by one as they get picked off one by one so the ultimate consequences of this being the wrong thing are very clear and we as an audience audience go on that journey with them. We don't go on Ryan's well, journey you. and empathize with Ryan. We you, empathize though. with this He's battalion almost... who were thinking, why, why are we doing this? Yeah, they're just the company. And, 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 and you know, I think that it's, he's almost like a movie monster and that you don't want to see too much of him because then he loses some of his mystique. Ryan. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah that's fine. But here's the, 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 but for you to, to argue that we know this is the wrong thing, considering the way the movie gets resolved, that last scene on the, on the bridge or the last scene in the cemetery, the bookended tearful old guy in the flag waving behind him. Yeah, that's that, so like, chauvinistic. I, yeah, I, I mean, completely. Just, so that, I don't no, know how, I, I don't know how you get to that we're supposed to know that's the wrong thing to do. I think we're supposed to accept that it's terrible that men die this way and we're supposed to care about each one of the men in this film, but that we accept that their death makes our lives in America now, I mean, you know, the lives of Americans yeah. now, the lives of allies now. To be honest now, with you, possible. I thought that, I think that that, one, what you're saying is true. I do think that that last scene in Ryan was incredible. I, I can't defend it. It's undefendable. It's indefensible. It's but not a good people love it. In fact, there's well, a part of me that I watch it every time. Yeah, he's, when he gets tearful, and the old lady comes over and he holds her. Yeah, and I get. I, I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah, there's there's a rapport through it as a film goer which we can like. But speaking on the on the playing field that we're speaking on now, right. the fact of the matter is is that that last scene is weak and it does diminish a huge quality of the movie. But I don't think because of the weakness of that last scene, Ryan should be held in any type of disregard as a totality of a movie. It has a weak ending. But that you can also look at that and think he's crying not because of what he's seen. He's crying because of the fucking guilt that he's feeling. Now, speaking as someone who's done many naughty things in my life that I've been busted for and I've been guilty of, <laughs> it's nice to hear from your mama that you're not a bad kid, you know? That's meant to appeal. I think it's, I think I think it's, it's more appealing than that. to I think, basic I think, instincts. I think what trying Spielberg to has tried to do is reduce the debt that all Americans now Oh, to all the servicemen and women in that cemetery and in all the cemeteries around Europe and all the cemeteries. Why do you the think States. they do so? Because it, because we understand things better in the context of one life. So if it's a life for a life, if it's the captain's life for the private's life, then we then it's a it's a way of seeing for Spielberg the the debt all of us owe. And so then the the question that you that you're supposed to ask yourself as you leave that film is. Am I living up to the sacrifice made on my behalf by all these men who died, men and women who died mm -hmm. in World War II? And Spielberg has said in interviews that he's a serious, um, uh, he, he's a great, serious devotee of the greatest generation, the side of the greatest generation, all these people. Mm -hmm. in, his, in his lifetime, when he was a boy, went abroad and fought this war so that he could live the baby boomer life that he lived. And all his, a lot of his films attest to this great love of this kind of baby boomer life that he's had. I mean, you know, he, and, and, and one of the, the bonds it seems to me that he has with Hanks is they both have this, just this big, uh, ham-handed, smiley gratitude about about where they are in their lives. You know, look at me. I can't believe all put my wealth. Put all that aside. No, but it's you can't you, just put it aside. Well, and I you, think you, you, your average moviegoer, fuck that. Not your average moviegoer. Eat what you're talking about, and I'm a huge movie fan, as you know, and as you guys know too. I didn't know that. I didn't know that he made comments like that. And even knowing it now doesn't change my perception of Ryan mm -hmm. because of where I was at the time of watching Ryan. I guess what frustrates me about Spielberg is when he sticks to, to I love Jaws. I think it's a you, great. You film. can't not but because love it's Jaws. because it's it's modest in scope. When he tries to go, when he tries to get that was an accident. The modesty. 
Remember well, that, it's modest, that was it's an It's not been modest and influence, but it's been mo- his, no, 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 his no, no, aim no. was his actual, aim was was modest. And that, they, no, it wasn't. That's the first quote unquote summer blockbuster. Yeah, but it wasn't okay, modest in but, scope. But they had then, a mechanical but it's when, fucking it's when, he's, when he's been puffed up by all of his uh, commercial success, and then he wants to branch out into things like. Uh, Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan and make political commentary. The political commentary he makes just isn't, for my taste, significant enough. It's not even That's even fine. Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket are there's a, a sharper edge on those films. I completely agree, they... I, which is why Apocalypse Now is my number two. I completely agree with you, but I think I, I'm directly comparing Private Ryan with. Thin Red Line here. But they came out in the same year. They're almost a natural. Other we could than, have done a show other than on the, that. Yeah, we could. But other than the fact that they came out the same year, other than the fact that they've both got good directors at their helm with an all-star cast, both of them, they do show a lot of similarities. I'm glad that you would admit that, that Terrence Malick is good. You seem to think I hate Malick. I hate two of his movies. I hate The New World and I hate The Thin Red Line. And I never got into this. The other reason I do not like The Thin Red Line, and this is something that we all said off camera, Lubeski, who is the cinematographer in The Thin Red Line, who has also been used by Alejandro and Yoritu, right? You mentioned uh, that it wasn't you, your personal view, although I think you agreed with this. One of the critics said that Inyaritu wastes Lubeski. Frankly, I think Lubeski's fucking wasted in the thin red line. All of the things you pointed out, like the contrast between sky and glass, that's all color editing. That's all post-production. That's nothing to do with Lubeski's cinematography. Lubeski was used in a capacity where it's like, grunt, nature shot, grunt, nature shot, grunt. It was so Fucking linear. You're almost, but you have to reorient your idea of what I mean. He, this is a Malik is a was literally was a philosopher translated Martin Heidegger from German into English. Was yeah. a was a professor of I, that of means philosophy. nothing I don't, to me. Well, dudes. let me let me finish talking, and, and you might understand why it's meaningful. And that All is that right. he is not trying to tell stories in the way that. You know, Spielberg has an almost formulaic way of telling a story. He has, even has the bookends, the narrative bookends of these characters, everything mm-hmm. comes down to these relationships among characters that you're asked to care about. Malick is trying to have dialogue between... A three, bird and a grunt. Between, no, between a, two officers, a colonel and a captain, between uh, a sergeant and his wayward private... Mm-hmm. Uh, played by Caviezel, John Penn and Caviezel, okay. um, between uh, Ben Chaplin and his wife at home. All, All of that about, about love, about uh, mm-hmm. about courage, service, duty, about yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the dark places in the li- in life and the light places in life, as you would have in a philosophical dialogue and not in a, a, a narrative, a story that moves through time. Now Great. it's set against the backdrop of one battle, but it, that very much it's as one critic said, it's more like. Um, a war movie, an epic tale. You're telling me about the good points of Malik here, yep. but you haven't addressed a single one of my concerns and, and issues with his movies. The main issue that I, I'm, I what have, I'm saying to you is if you, if you and reevaluate what he's, but but okay, it breaks your up the flow Oscar, of the movie. Your vaunted Oscar, you know, the, the Academy uh, gave it a be, both the best best picture nod. It gave it a best director. What else was out that year? Saving Private Ryan, and that one. Yes, because and why is that? Because it's better. Because it's a better fucking movie. No, I, I because I'm a, I'm the film snob, and I'm going to hold out for the fact that that actually <laughs> the, the more people hashtag film snob. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to get a bandwagon bit. hashtag bandwagon <laughs> hashtag too easy. You know what? Film snob is pretty. Here easy we go. Too. I'm I'm going to come to. I'm going to raise myself up to your level here, and I'm going to become a film snob here for a minute because my number one. I mean, we still got to do the Rushmore after, so we got to get on with this. But my number one is another Kubrick movie. It's a fucking classic, and it is one of my top five movies of all time, let alone war movies. God, I love this movie. And I think it is more relevant now in the few weeks away from Donald Trump about to be your US president. Please don't let it happen. But if it does, it's more relevant now than ever. Dr. Strangelove. Comments? Great movie. I mean, it's three <laughs> Kubrick movies. Yeah. On, on, on a list of 10 or of 20. Says it all, right? Yeah. I mean, Dr. Strangelove, subtitled, All How I Learned to Stop Caring and Love the Bomb. This is, some people call it an anti-war movie, and I think that in itself makes it a war movie. And I think what your student said about Apocalypse Now, it, uh, you know, about the fact that we see very little of war, is even more applicable for this. Because you literally, you don't see war. There's not a single battle scene in this movie. It takes place in two confined areas in a war room and in the in the cockpit of a very very large B52 bomber that's it it's all confined the, but it's the, slim pickings in it it's slim pickings but the scope 
of the war being, of, sorry, not, not of the war, of the world being at the mercy of two idiots. It, for, and that's how they were portrayed in a satirical way, purposefully, I believe. Because to have two idiots being one button push away from world destruction, that's a scary thought. And like it or not, not saying that the current leaders of the world are idiots, read into that what you will, but that is the reality we live in. World destruction is just a button push away. And that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. That is a scary fucking thought. And I thought Dr. Strangelove portrayed that in both a masterful way, a satirical way, an anti-war way. It's got an all-star cast, George C. Scott, who some of you might know, who also played Patton. And you've also- That was on my honorable mention. I thought it Do might have Do you have an honorable mention list? I do. Okay. I do have an honorable Bridge mention Bridge on the River Kwai. Bridge on the River Kwai was one of them. Um, Believe it or not, I'm a big fan of We Were Soldiers. I really like We Were Soldiers. I also- Lawrence of Arabia, which would have challenged- uh, oh, there's war. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of a war uh, movie. That's probably why I didn't make, I mean, it's a great movie, whether it makes it onto your great war movies list. Peter Sellers, one of the greatest actors who ever lived, three different roles he plays in this, and has one of the best lines in cinema history. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. What a line. What a line. Go see this fucking movie. Right, we gotta do the Rushmore. All right, so do we, is that automatic from our top four? We just- No, 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 no. It's gotta be anywhere from both of our lists, essentially. Let's show the full scale of what war movies can be. We can probably only have one Kubrick, but we both chose Full, full metal, metal Jacket. jacket. It has so we to should be put that up there. Yeah, let's go Full Metal Jacket. Okay. For the reasons you've mentioned, you can have the Thin Red Line, that's okay. I'm getting, I'm getting the other two. I'm getting the other two. No, no, I mean, make this an argument. I mean, I do feel that there's some validity for Dr. Strangelove being on there. I would rather have Dr. Strangelove than Saving Private Ryan. I'm happy with that. I love, uh, actually. Uh, ha. Ha. What? Yeah, well, then what takes the fourth spot? You're going to say Apocalypse Now? Well, we both chose it. I refuse to lose the red line to fucking save it, Private Ryan. We got a problem. It's no. I won't do it. Well, do you want to have neither of them on there? Uh, we could do Apocalypse now. Full Metal Jacket. Okay, okay, let's do it this way. What's a better movie to you? Full Metal Jacket or Thin Red Line? What's a better movie? What's a better war movie? What's a, what's a better war movie? What is a better war movie? Thin Red Line or Full Metal Jacket? <laughs> you know you the know, difficulty of the movie Mount Rushmore. I, I look. I, I will take Thin Red Line home with me, and that'll be my movie. And then we can put. Thin Red Line. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, no, no, no. Don't just submit to me here. I mean, it's got to be. I'm not it, submitting to you. I'm saying I'm, so I'm absolutely not submitting to you. I'm saying I have my own internal rubric by which I choose these <laughs> films. I mean, look. You know, it's it's. It is the most radical, one of the things about the Thin Red Line that I didn't get to is it's the most radical anti-war movie on this list. Because it's- More, than, more so than Doctor Strange Yes, Love? because Doctor Strange Love wants to take place in the war room. It has Slim Pickens, Slim Pickens riding the bomb down, waving his cowboy hat. Um, Thin Red Line is about the fact, in some ways, I think it's a critique of war films in the sense that they are have such tunnel vision about whether or not, like take something no. like Lone Survivor. They, it's I about think you whether- want it to be a critique of war movies. Because it refuses to play, it refuses, it, it insists on acknowledging everything else that's going on around. It the has every single war trope known to man. Loving, lovey lover at home, big battle scene, generals not necessarily doing what's right by right, their troops. We have to stop talking I about mean, this movie. I mean, it's got we, we every to, single have, you stereotype just hate it, known you to You hate it more than I will. I hate like. it because you overblew it and hey, give it too much. Too, you, too much je ne sais quoi. You give it too much. Everything that you hail so it for. So I guess for, it's not going to go on Rushmore. Let's move it on. It can okay? go on Rushmore. No, no, no. You, you, it's Full Metal our Jacket. Rushmore. Full Metal it's Jacket. Our Rushmore. Apocalypse not my Rushmore. Now. What else? Full Metal Jacket. Apocalypse. Now we both chose both of them. So that okay. So they show something them. different. They show the training of war. They show the. You've got the dehumanization. If I give you of Saving from, Private Ryan, you give me Thin Red Line, and we both go home happy. Let's do that. All right. All right. Agreed. Ladies and gentlemen, here it officially is. Then. The Professor and the Student's official movie, Mount Rushmore. The truant. <laughs> the truant. The tyrant. In no particular order. The movie, Mount Rushmore, war movie list. Our first entry is... Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. 
Our second entry is... Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. Our third entry is... The Thin Red Line, directed by Terrence Malick. Our final entry into war movies, the greatest war movies of all time, is... Saving Private Crying, directed by Steven Spielberg. Say it properly. <laughs> Say it properly. Saving Private Ryan! There you go. So over to you guys. What did you think? What are your favorite war movies of all time? I know a lot of you are going to be angry about the fact that Inglorious Bastards didn't make the list. Get over it. We didn't like it. Tarantino should stick to doing indie movies. Get over it. All right. And I can hear the comments coming. But seriously, what are your favorite war movies? And... What are your favorite uh, non-war movies, anti-war movies, comedy war movies? Throw anything at us. What's your movie, Matt Rushmore? If you are watching on YouTube, again, guys, please hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Leave those thoughts and comments below. And remember, you can find it in the description, a link to our iTunes podcast where you can download this movie, where you can download this top 10 list for free. So what are you waiting for? Go do it now. Go share it with your friends. And if you are listening on iTunes, thank you for listening. As always, make sure you tune in next weekend for another top 10 list. Bobby, where can the readers and watchers, sorry, readers where can the listeners and watchers find you where are you on the internet where can we find you you can find me at uh bob Kowser, um on uh, instagram and on facebook and you can go stalk him online too he's got a lot of great work out there you should all read go buy some of bob Kowser's books and as always from me i am nicolero this has been the top 10 show and i'll see you guys next weekend see ya